Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Door Stuck. It's myself, Bach, as your host. My co-host for the show is going to be none other than Mitchell Langford, also known as Magic Helmet. Thanks for joining me, bud. Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, excited for the second installment. Had a lot of fun the first time, and uh, we have a spicy topic today, so it should be a good one. Yeah. Now, the last week of Counter-Strike was filled with a lot of information. A lot of things went down, you know, between... What's been going on around us? Obviously, Elephant in the Room, the coronavirus, constantly impacting the world around us. DreamHack Masters has now switched to an online format. Uh, Smuya, who was playing for Team Chaos, had to return to the UK to renew his passport, but due to the coronavirus, or not his passport, his visa, he can't actually renew it now. So as a result, Chaos had no choice, and they had to let him go, which is kind of a bummer because I was really enjoying watching that team play. They had an awesome dynamic with everyone on the team. It was kind of like a bunch of memers. <laughs> and uh, it, it worked out really well. I was really excited to see how that team was going to progress. Unfortunately, it kind of falls flat uh, because of what happened with Smuya. And then one of the bigger scandals from the last week was with Flashpoint. Um, it feels like that is a consistent thing we'll be talking about on the show. Flashpoint is the newer league in Counter-Strike, for those that are unfamiliar, competing with the ESL's Pro League. But... Flashpoint hasn't really seemed to match Pro League's level of competition and thus viewership, expectations, fan response, etc. What's your opinion, before we get into our main topic of the day, what's your opinion on what's going on with Flashpoint? And then I'll kind of jump into what the scandal was, so to speak. Yeah, so just one thing to note is that, you know, Flashpoint is technically a new league, new uh, league that's been around here. So it's going to take a little bit of time to get up to the viewership uh, of ESL if it en does end up getting there. But uh, one of the issues that is I've seen on Twitter is that there's been um, kind of an inflation of that viewership numbers. And some of the talking heads for the league are kind of touting that as, you know, proof of concept and that, you know, they're just as good as ESL. Whether or not they are is debatable. You know, we're not going to talk about that today. But one thing I wanted to note is that, um, you know, one of the controversies is them embedding their stream on the face of client or on the website. And if I'm them and I have a platform where I can get my video in front of that many people, like I'm going to do it. But the issue is that if you're using those numbers to push out to sponsors or you're just kind of bragging about it, like that's an issue. So I'm all about embedding it on these websites that, you know, it's a great marketing tool. Why would you not use it? Um, but if you use it for other purposes, I know that's where it kind of gets problematic and there's a bit of a gray area though. So, um, yeah, I mean, I love the concept behind Flashpoint. Um, and I think it's going to be a great league eventually, you know, it's just going to take a little bit of time to refine everything. Yeah. I'd say in general, they're doing a pretty decent job with, with their league. Like the content is great. I think they're doing a yeah. great job with the content. The team of people behind the project are awesome. I think there's a little bit of frustration with some of the people in our community. Uh, I know Sir Scoots has been very vocal about Flashpoint, not moving to uh, remote broadcasts and continuing to have a production studio running. Uh, he's like, you got to let these people go home. Like this is not a joke. Uh, so he's been very vocal about that and has not shied away from talking about that. Um, I'd say the competition has been a little bit of a lower level when you look at the teams that they've brought in. They've had some yeah, sc some no scandals, unfortunately, like the whole Flashpoint uh, Fun Plus Phoenix thing. That was a huge, like not necessarily a scandal, but like it just felt like everything was poorly handled from uh, the minute that things kind of transitioned from Heroic to FPX to bringing in Bad News Bears as a replacement. There was just so much misinformation and for a league that, you know, brags about it and honestly they do brag brags yeah, about do. their level of transparency and competition it felt very off like i could see something like that happening with someone like esl because esl is a lot quieter with the community about what's going on in the background this was something that's supposed to be a public display and it just didn't feel like the information was made available to the community yep. but again the main scandal really with with flashpoint this weekend was what you said embedding the stream on face its website to juke the stats now people have made a fair point esl does the same thing with their pro league on esea's website but the main difference between those two is that flashpoint or that that face it can be done entirely from the website you want to join a game you want to play find teams join hubs whatever all of that's done from the website so you're casting out a much wider net and then in addition uh, face it has like the free-to-play platform so there is a yeah. swath of users using that website and not using the client 
I, now I don't know if the web if the video was embedded in the client because the client is really just the website turned into a client. But either way, you have a large captive audience on that website at any given point in time. So you watch, you could actually see the numbers go up exponentially the second they embedded the stream there. Because if you looked the weeks before when they weren't doing it, they were getting not slaughtered, but they weren't comparing it at, at all to the numbers that ESL was pulling in on Pro League. Now all of a sudden, their rebroadcasts have thirty-five thousand viewers, yeah. and actually, there was a—I think it was uh, Professor and Don Hasi were going back and forth, pointing out the statistics, showing that like normally for a rebroadcast of ESL's media, it would be a five percent difference between the chatters and the non-chatters. So people that were watching potentially an embedded stream somewhere that doesn't have chat, for these streams, it was like ninety-five percent of the people did not have chat. So that's why it's a big deal. But the main thing we really wanted to talk about, despite the fact that all this happened in the last week, was the news that was dropped more recently by Valve. Actually, just yesterday, the Valve Major finally giving us some more info. So we now have... I love this little uh, animated title bar i don't i didn't show this to you but it plays the door stock audio and i absolutely love it yeah uh, <laughs> i'm glad you picked the name for the the show yeah the internet, so the, the the valve change that we've seen come in as my internet tanks hopefully you guys can hear me is uh now they've they've released all of this additional information so let's go ahead and take a look. You guys will be able to see it on stream with us so you can get an idea of what it is exactly that we're talking about. So Valve now has released information regarding the road to the November Major because, again, the Brazil Major was supposed to be very soon, right around the corner, and now it has moved all the way to November. Yeah, getting pushed back this far, I mean, it makes sense. It should give us or give them a window to be pretty confident that this land is going to be happening just because of, uh, you know, the coronavirus or COVID-19 um, kind of making a lot of these events have to push back. I think that's far enough where it's going to make sense and we can be pretty confident that it'll happen. So it's good that they've landed on a date. Um $2 million, we discussed that last time. I mean, it's a huge amount of money, definitely a lot that's going to be on the line for these tournaments. But everything else is up in the air, which is it's pretty wild, you know, kind of how they've made the adjustment to what they've landed on here um, with this regional major rankings uh, set up. Uh, as you mentioned, we got this yesterday, so I'm still kind of combing through it, trying to make sense of it. And hopefully we're able to help um, kind of communicate that today here on the show. But um, one thing I noticed, I, I went to go back on uh, Liquipedia to see who the Legends teams were um, that had been qualified that would be be given uh, free access to the major without having to go through any qualifier. Uh, but now that's already been adjusted. Nobody has any spot right now, and it's all open on Liquipedia, which um, kind of mirrors what uh, Valve is trying to do here, which is really interesting. If you're a Legend and you know you thought you had that secure spot or you secured a minor spot, and you're going to have to go through this process again. You know that's a really big deal. Um, but if you're a team that wasn't already qualified, or if you were a team that missed out on the minors, this is a great opportunity. So mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting how it all plays out. If I'm a Legend team and I don't end up making it, um, you know I'm going to be a little salty. But at the same time, you know it's an even play playing field at this point in my mind. The crazy thing when you look at this is they talk about this new regional major ranking system. And the regional major ranking system is based on their RMR, regional major ranking, series. So effectively what Valve has dipped their toes into because of coronavirus is a league. Yeah. Which is like, okay, everyone's been talking about ESL Pro League and Flashpoint, but now there's potentially this third player in Valve where Valve is, is effectively running their own tournament structure and league with a little bit of a, a grain of salt, it's still being run by third-party organizers. Now, yep. it does only mention that first series. So we'll scroll down and uh, get that information on the first series. I think it's on there right now. Now let's scroll down. There you 2020 go. 2020 May. 2020 May. So the first series of these RMR competitions will be in May and will be hosted by ESL. All teams that should have been or would have been invited to the uh, May Rio Major or the May Rio Minors will be invited to compete for position in the region. Current Legends and Challengers will start with some regional major ranking points. So effectively, if you're already a Legend or a Challenger, you already have RMR points. We don't know how the RMR points work yet. They haven't actually explained RMR points. All they've explained is the concept 
But then you dial back a little bit more and you can also see some more information that's kind of interesting. Invitations based on region. So yeah. based Europe, on past performance. Too. Yeah, so Europe is actually going to get more invitation slots than NA and CIS. But NA actually gets almost the same amount as the CIS region. And that includes teams unable to travel. So that means like any team who is in Europe that's playing in North America right now that that fits into that block is technically counted as NA. So this would be even more lopsided Europe and actually technically is more lopsided Europe, which is something that people have been asking about for a long time. Why doesn't Europe get the most slots? Why isn't it, you know, they, they've been wanting to see more of the European teams get these slots. But then CIS comes in with five, and people have talked all this trash about the CIS region. Going back, I remember, what is it, Draken had that famous quote talking about how easy it was, and then he got stomped by a CIS team yeah. during the, the minor, I believe. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, this is an interesting breakdown. You know, throughout the past, it's, you know, should teams be able to travel to a certain region to make it easier? And right now, we're kind of getting a signal here for NA that, um, if there's already European teams in here, that's going to be uh, NA based. Uh, there's no change really. So it's interesting to see the breakdown here. Challengers are going to be five for Europe, um, three for Legends, uh, which matches the NA and CIS comes up one short there. But you can see total invitations from Europe are going to be 10, which makes sense. There's a lot of really good teams in that area. But, you know, CIS alone having five, I think is great. Um, and I'm interested to see how this all breaks down. And specifically, I want to see what the point distribution is going to be based on, you know, wins and specific matches. If it's, if it's going to be based on matches, is it going to be placement within a tournament? You know, how are they going to lay this all out? And when are we going to get that information? Because right now we don't have that. And I'm sure if I'm a team, I want that information as quickly as possible so they can plan accordingly. Um, but yeah, the first one looks like it's going to be in May for the RMR series hosted by ESL, which is great. I'm sure they're really happy they're able to be the host of that. So that's when it's all really going to kick off. And we, when before that actually happens, uh, we should have all the information, including the points, um, before that uh, event starts. Now, when you start looking down at the FAQ, they actually say, how are the regional major rankings calculated? The regional major rankings will be points-based, and the value of events closer to the major will be greater than earlier events. So effectively, if you win events closer leading up to the major, you're actually generating more points on the RMR standings. So winning these early events like this May one might not even have that much of an impact. We don't know. Even they say, however, we won't have a detailed breakdown before we finalize the RML events for the year. But the most important important thing and the, the most interesting thing to me is actually that second point in the FAQ. Will there be minors for the November Rio major? No. No. There will be no minors. So the only way to qualify is through this RMR system which completely changes the dynamic of Valve's previous majors and makes you wonder if this goes well, that Valve will continue to use this moving forward. The way that they did minors before, obviously there was a heavy cost associated with running those minors because they became LAN events. Now, I don't know how they'll handle RMR moving forward if coronavirus is done in six months and we're back to having LAN events again, if that's going to have an impact. On this, even, maybe they'll say, like, the last RMR event is a LAN, and it's effectively like the minor, and it's the most points you can get. Or maybe they'll continue to run things online. I really don't know. But I'd like to think that this could potentially usher in an era where Valve is running a circuited league event. So they run multiple events throughout the year. They have their own standings. All of that goes into the major. They let ESL run Pro League, and they let Flashpoint run as well. And all the other tournament organizers can have their piece of the pie. But if that does end up being the case, which it could because of the fact that this could go well and be well received, that drastically changes the dynamic of Counter-Strike. Because right now, it is already so difficult to schedule an event without conflicting with somebody else's event. Even on a lower end scale, like the events that we run at Nerd Street, our majors and minors, they might not appeal to the pro audience, but they'll appeal to the semi-pros competing in things like Mountain Dew League or even a DreamHack Open, it's really difficult to find time to schedule those events because there's so many events going on simultaneously. Yeah, and you know some of those events inevitably are going to overlap, so you got to kind of pick and choose, and you, you don't want to overlap one of these tournaments that are going on, if at all possible. But at some point, 
uh, in some points it's unavoidable. But one thing I wanted to know, but I wanted to know going back is the, the major rankings with the points based being a little bit higher towards when the actual event is going to be happening. That's an interesting idea. And it kind of, I think the thought process behind that is basically trying to figure out who is in the best form closest to the majors. So they're kind of weighting it towards who's playing best right when the major is going to be happening. So it's, it's a cool concept there by ESL, but if you're a winner of one of the events, you know, for example, the one in May and you get, you know, one quarter of a point worth of what uh, the event that is right before the major, you know, how, how do you feel about that? And you don't do it so well in that, last event that happens before the major you know how do you feel about that is it you know a quarter of a point a half a point relative to uh the events that are going on later it, it'll be interesting to see how that all um unfolds but just generally i'm excited to the, get this going and one of the points here on the website is that uh there's going to be two hundred fifty five thousand dollar prize pool yeah uh, for the may event yeah, so that's what I wanted to get into next was the May and Fall uh, RMR series will have $255,000 in prizes divided across regions. So it's not 255 total for everyone. Well, yeah. it is, I guess, technically. But it's not 255 total up for grabs for each region. It's split apart into chunks based on how many teams are playing from each region. So CIS and NA will get less and the other regions like South America and uh, Southeast Asia, Oceanic region, those guys will get even smaller pieces of the pie. But it's a minimum of $10,000, which to me is kind of wild. Now, uh, I don't know how many teams potentially will be competing in these because we're still trying to like understand how this is all going to work. Like when you look, we'll go back up to the, the listing of the regions. If, if it's South America and there's only one team invited, where who do they play against in, in, this, yeah. in this fall event? Like, how does, how does that work? I don't really understand how that's going to come into play. Obviously, that's something that we need to have more understanding of. Um, but you can, you can definitely see that this is, again, like Valve sort of dipping its toes into the world of, of running an online league. Uh, and running a potential qualifying league that translates to how the majors are going to be reshaped in the future. I mean, I'm kind of excited about this. I'm very excited about this. I mean, it's going to have an impact on the rest of the the tournament organizers that run these events. Um, but I think Valve having a little bit more control and having a league is is interesting concept. And, you know, whenever they have an event, it's going to be great. And it's just whether or not, you know, the points distribution works out the way they want it to and kind of how I'm interested to see how it, how well it's received by the teams, uh, how they've laid this out. Like, I haven't really seen too many Twitter posts about, you know, hey, this is great. I don't like this. I haven't really had an opportunity to check that out yet. But um, yeah, this is a, it's exciting. That's for sure. It's something new here for Counter-Strike, you know, kind of freshen things up a little bit. Um, and if I'm ESL or if I'm Flashpoint or one of those organizations, I, I would welcome this. This isn't something you would want to be upset about. You know, there might be situations where you might have to reschedule an event uh, or a series because there's a Valve event, event going on. But um, I think this is just generally healthy for the, the CSGO scene in general. Now, one of the final points on this relates to roster changes. Can a team change their roster? The last two points are actually really interesting. So if a team changes region, they now lose all of their points. So Oof, if a team, yeah, if a team switches from say Europe to North America, they lose all of their points. Now I don't, I don't really know what that means. Like we don't, we don't really know what constitutes switching regions. Is it moving to California to compete in Flashpoint, or is it competing specifically in North American leagues, or is it Temporary reloc relocation. How long do you have to live somewhere else to be classified as relocating? I really don't know. Valve hasn't given us all those information, uh, all the data that we need. So all we know is if you move your team, you could lose all of your points. But they did say that you can make roster changes. And this is something we talked about in episode one. In episode one of Doorstuck, we talked about how now there was a like nine-month break from when teams first qualified to the actual events itself. How do you not change rosters in nine months? Like, that's a long time for a lot of teams to go without changing rosters. 
Yeah, I feel like it's unavoidable for 90% of the teams, maybe like 95% of the teams not yeah. being able to switch rosters. So it looks like that's uh, been addressed already. You know, we talked about it on the last show, and it's already been addressed by Valve. You're welcome, guys. So, um, like, top five <laughs> top five are basically the only teams that don't really make large roster changes, I'd yeah. say, year to year. So year over year, usually the top five teams are the ones that aren't making big changes. But after a year is when they start to. So like the, I'd say they could last about 12 months before they make a significant change, and that's assuming you're the fifth-place team and you haven't been winning. If you're the team that's consistently in fifth or fourth, you're going to try to make a change to bump up that last spot. But making a change comes at a significant cost. 20% of your points are lost per player. Yeah. That's yeah, it's nice. interesting that they included that. Yeah. Uh, if you're trying to make that, you know, gas yourself up just a little bit more give yourselves a little bit more firepower. Maybe, you know, your in-game leader needs to change. You, you may might not agree with uh, kind of what their philosophy is. You, you only recognize that after X amount of months or a year. Um, and losing 20% of those points, that's that's a pretty big deal. But again, we don't know what the, po the point distribution is, and we don't know how much of an effect that will have. But just the number 20% that just at face value seems pretty significant. So it'll make teams think twice about switching players Um before they actually do it. Think about it, you know, more than they might normally. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of curious how this is going to, like this is going to really reshape the free agency market in Counter-Strike because you can only make two switches, period. So you can only make two switches leading up to an event at a cost of 20% of the team's points per player. So you lose 40% if you switch out two players. You can adjust yeah, the roster no. prior to the roster lock, but it doesn't explain if you can do this before each RMR event because right now they've only mentioned two RMR events. Uh, they, all, they mentioned the May event and a fall event. So if there's only the two, can you change two players before each event? Is there going to be other events that they just haven't announced? We don't really know. But I'm assuming they mean two total. So if you can only make two changes total, that's difficult for some teams. That's still impactful. It's good that they do give them a little bit of autonomy or a little bit of wiggle room to make those changes, but they do kind of you know, add, add in a kind of a, a penalty, you might say, uh, for making those changes. But yeah, I mean, it, it's nice that they have the ability to have two. Um, but yeah, still, I mean, a lot of teams are going to be switching more than two over that time span. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Huh. A lot to take in and a lot of information not really available from valve but we hope we helped you guys understand it just a little bit more and again there was a lot that happened this week it wasn't just that but that was one of the most important pieces of information that valve has dropped on us in a long time the only other thing i want to mention and this is something that's kind of interesting one of the staff from valve made a post recently on a reddit thread talking about the development changes because of what's going on with covid and he mentioned that there is stuff currently being worked on, but they're they're held right now because people are working from home, so they don't have the access to the hardware they normally would in the office. So as much as we've gotten frustrated with Valve over their lack of attention to Counter-Strike over the last year to two years, something is coming. Something is happening. If they could just get a, give us a crumb or a clue of what that was to hold us over, that'd be great. I mean, I, I said this probably about two years ago on a facebook live stream i said if valve is not working on either a port of a new engine or a yeah. new game completely valve should expect someone else to come along and sweep the rug out from under them at the time i said riot's first person shooter could be that game we didn't know anything about it at the time all, all we knew was that it was working it was being worked on that might end up becoming a prophecy because yeah. <laughs> it's looking like Valorant is significantly going to damage Counter-Strike's community by stealing players away. Maybe not the upper echelon top-level pro players, but all the semi-pros who are having a hard time cracking into that top level, they'll probably jump ship pretty quickly because they can see a way to potentially get on a pro team really fast by exploiting their already good mechanical skills and beating people before they can understand the game. So... If those guys jump ship, the, the whole community is going to be reshaped. So hopefully Valve understands that, recognize that, and that's why they're working on this sort of counter punch, a, a return blow, so that the game doesn't suffer a significant loss. Because I'd like to think both games can exist simultaneously. I don't want to see one game kill the other. I think that's foolish. I think that both games can exist at the same time. They offer two different play styles, so there's no reason why that can't be the case. But... I'm hoping. I'm hoping that Valve's got something yeah. in the works, whether it's uh, a new Counter-Strike or 
porting to a new engine, like people have mentioned, apparently they're working on a Source 3 engine. If that's the case, I don't know. It would really be awesome to see. But unfortunately, that might get delayed significantly because of COVID. So who knows when it's going to happen? Yeah, any challenge, any games in the past that have come in and kind of been like the CSGO killer uh, haven't really worked out. CSGO is pretty undefeated at this point. I mean, it's been around 20 years, so it's going to take a lot to, you know, kind of knock down CSGO a little bit. Uh, Val uh, Valorant seems interesting, and you can see there's a lot of big personalities on Twitch um, that are going to be playing it today. And, you know, some of them might be converting over to that game when it comes out. Obviously, it's going to be dependent on how good the game is. And some of those are CS players. Um, whether or not they're dedicated, uh, you know, competitive players, or they're just kind of more of a streamer in some some senses, but yeah, I mean, this it does provide the opportunity or the chance that it could destabilize CS:GO a little bit. But in my mind, CS:GO is undefeated. It'll it'll be able to make those adjustments, especially if there's uh, something coming down the pipeline from Valve right now that they have in the works. And I'm actually curious if they had been they had a a game plan and a roadmap to have something pushed out right when Valorant was going to be coming out to, to kind of counteract it. And if that's being pushed back, that kind of messes up their plan a little bit. So um, I'm excited for a little bit of competition. I think it's only going to raise the bar for Valve and them pushing out content for CSGO. So I welcome it personally. I absolutely agree. Mitch, thank you for joining me on the show again. It was a pleasure having a, a chance to talk about this very complex information that Valve has given us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a fantastic time. Thanks again, Mark. And uh, I assume we'll be doing this next week. Oh, we will be doing this again less, next week, guys. We will be live every Friday at noon right here. So if you guys like the show, make sure you come back next week. We hope to see you guys then.